Paul leaves the stage, uh, I wanted to just uh, say that uh, one of the tools in, in uh, promoting improved nutrition is fortification, where we add micronutrients to um, uh, common foodstuffs. And uh, as we get ready for the, before we go to the coffee break, we want to fortify your thinking with one more microdose of information. And this is going to come from Sahara Moon Chapatin, who leads the research division in the Bureau for Food Security. So over to you, Sahara Moon. Good morning. It's really great to be here. So today I'm going to tell you about how we're using science and technology to meet Feed the Future objectives of sustainably reducing poverty and improving nutrition. And I'm going to do this by focusing on our legume investments. Legumes, beans, cowpeas, groundnuts, chickpeas, soybeans, these are really at the heart of the Feed the Future research strategy for three main reasons. They're highly nutritious. We just heard a lot about how that's important. They're a source of income for smallholder farmers, especially for women, and they're an important source of uh, soil fertility. But despite these amazing qualities, legumes have historically received a very low level of investment compared to other crops like cereals. We, we see lots of research on rice, wheat, and maize, but relatively little on legumes. So our research investments under Feed the Future span the entire legume value chain and they range from advanced genomic solutions to very simple management strategies um, and interventions. So in Malawi, it's very typical for uh, farmers to grow maize, a monocrop of maize after maize after maize. So here in this field in Malawi, we're trying, we're evaluating a new system called doubled up legumes. The farmers will plant groundnut or, so or perhaps soybean along with a perennial pigeon pea crop. They'll harvest the groundnut, that's what you see here, in the, the, the man is holding the groundnut. They'll harvest the groundnut, and then they'll come back and they'll harvest the pigeon pea. The pigeon pea will start growing back. They'll plant a maize on inside the same field where the pigeon pea is regrowing. They'll harvest a second crop of pigeon pea, and then they'll harvest the maize. And now the soil is, the soil is beautifully fertile, they can plant another maize crop. So if you were counting, that was five crops in three seasons. Farmers are diversifying their incomes. They're, they're getting more than just maize out of the soil. They're diversifying their diets, assuming they're, they're consuming some of these products. They're also getting a really valuable source of fodder for their livestock. And finally, they're improving the quality of the soil and really enhancing the nitrogen content. It's also a beautifully low-tech solution. This is a more high-tech solution. Cow pea, or as we know it, black-eyed pea, is consumed by over 200 million uh, people in Africa. But cow pea is devastated by an insect pest, the Maruca pod borer. And there's really no source of resistance within cow pea against this insect pest. So a team of scientists took a gene, an insect resistance gene from a soil bacterium, and they put it into a cow pea variety. And then they've, field, they've tested these cow pea varieties across West Africa, so far in Nigeria, in Burkina Faso, and in Ghana. And in every case, under high insect pressure, the biotech cow pea variety has significantly outperformed the, the regular cowpea. And you can see from this photo here, on the left, that's the conventional cowpea, just a few seeds under high insect pressure. On the right, two different plants producing large numbers of cowpea seed. So I know biotech is quite controversial, but if I were a farmer, I'd like to think that I would want to grow the biotech cowpea. It, it seems pretty straightforward. Here's another high-tech solution, but also really quite simple. As you all know, aflatoxins are a major food contaminant in many countries in Africa and around the world. It's a big problem in groundnut and in maize and in many other crops. But without a rapid detection solution, it's very hard for farmers or processors to determine whether or not their crop is aflatoxin contaminated, which is the first step you would need in order to try to remove that from the food supply. So I realize this photo looks a bit like swim goggles, and it's probably, I suspect, actually a photo that someone found on the internet of like swim or safety goggles. That's, that's my suspicion. But what it's meant to represent is a concept that's being developed by our peanut and mycotoxin innovation lab called afla goggles. The idea is the farmer, or perhaps someone who owns a storage facility, could put on these afla goggles, and they would be able to see, it's a spectral-based technology, they would be able to see whether and where their field or their facility is contaminated with aflatoxin. That's pretty exciting. I know in the research division, we just basically can't get, wait to get our hands on one of these, and 
we're probably gonna use them first when we're out in the day in the field, we're gonna get back to the hotel, we're gonna sit at the bar, we're gonna put on our aflatoxin, our affle goggles, and then we're gonna decide whether or not to eat the roasted peanuts. Because you know, right now we look at them and we're like, oh, I wanna eat them, but I shouldn't. So anyway, so that's <laughs> high tech, but also really easy to use. And that's the kind of solution um, that, that's under development. But I wanna bring it back to results, because research is a long-term endeavor. Some of these um, efforts take many, many years, but in the end run, they deliver. This woman is a Guatemalan bean farmer. She's holding a bowl of very nutritious beans. She's standing in front of her recent bean harvest. These beans were developed, these bean varieties were developed by a regional network of researchers in Latin America in partnership with um, Michigan State University. And they developed bean varieties that were high yielding and disease resistant. But just developing these bean varieties didn't automatically get them into the hands of farmers. The um, networks to deliver these bean varieties to farmers were really weak. And so they also had to pilot and test new models of seed production. This was very effective. They reached in the first phase of the project over 100,000 farmers with these new bean varieties. But now the Guatemala mission is taking this one step further. And in line with the discussion we just heard, they're going to be integrating nutrition messaging along with the new bean varieties and reaching even more farmers in Guatemala. But we couldn't do all of this without our research partners. The examples I just told you about involved CGIR centers, private companies, our national research partners in the countries, the developing countries where we work, NGOs, and also, of course, the US university community. So I'm gonna end with a shout out to the Feed the Future Innovation Labs. These 23 innovation labs are tapping into the expertise and the scientific and the, the innovations coming out of almost 70 US colleges and universities. And together, these innovation labs are training about 350 students currently right now. So these are the students that will become the next generation of researchers and will deliver the kinds of results that I've been talking about. Thank you.